Hello, I'm Alec Avdikov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. Before we get to today's episode, I must thank all of you who contribute to my Patreon. You help this podcast continue to improve into a platform where anybody can be educated about this time period. I also want to thank Dr. Burns and Ashley Hibbets for rating me on Audible. Any feedback is extremely appreciated, and I implore you all to go to your favorite podcast platform and give me an honest rating. Thank you all for listening and caring about this crazy podcast of mine. You can also follow me on social media and email me questions about the show. So, the topic of today's discussion is extremely important for people who take history seriously. History, despite popular conceptions, is not something that is set in stone. History is a fluid story that depends upon the bias of the historian covering the topic as well as what the historian chooses to include in the narrative. The study of how this ever-changing story unfolds is called historiography. The historiography surrounding Frederick the Great is the topic of today's episode. This is important because most people believe that history is an unbiased account of past events. This can never be true. The best histories actually admit to the biases that do exist. On today's episode, we have a guest from the UK named Hryn Hughes. He just finished his degree in history and wrote a dissertation on Frederick the Great. This discussion is extremely important to understand the overall story surrounding the history of Frederick the Great. A behind-the-scenes look at the historical writing process, if you will. I want to thank Rin for being on the show. He was great to talk with. The next voice you will hear is my own, introducing our guest from across the Atlantic. So today on The Life and Times of Frederick the Great, we have a very interesting guest. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to us? Hello, my name is Hrin. I recently graduated in history and archaeology at the University of Cardiff, and I wrote my dissertation on Frederick the Great. So uh, I've always been interested in history and warfare in this period in particular, military history of any period. And I think with Frederick the Great, he's the sort of poster child of military historians and especially Prussia with their martial history and tradition. So that's how I ended up going into the topic. Gotcha, gotcha. So overall, what is your background in history? Uh, how, did, how did you get uh, interested in Frederick the Great? Well, history's always been a hobby of mine. You know, I, I sort of grew up with all the old retro films, you know, the 70s with, you know, military films. It started off as with World War Two, then World War One. I. I always had a funness for the sort of red coat uniform of the British regulars and the tricorns you know so the interest has always been there and I suppose I didn't specialize or look into something specific until my history degree for the dissertation and at first it was going to be about Prussia's military but then I found that although there's a lot of stuff that's been written about Frederick the Great he's still somewhat of an elusive person so I thought, oh, well, you know, who is this guy? So, of course, I had to, you know, dig deeper and deeper and through loads of gateway drug books and, you know, all the mythology around him. You know, it's, it just ended up having to find out more and more about this guy. One of my greatest sayings about Frederick the Great is that you cannot put him into a box. No matter what you do, you can't really figure out who this guy really is. The Nazis tried to put him in a box, the Weimar Republic, obviously. And more recent times, too, with the LGBTQ version of Frederick the Great, it doesn't really fully capture him into any historical truth. There's no pithy way to explain Frederick the Great. There's always going to be contradictions. Yeah, exactly. Like one thing I read in Dennis Schalter's book on Frederick the Great and military history, he said, like, there's a Frederick for every person, you know, and yeah, it's absolutely right, especially if uh, where the historiography is being handled now, I think it wasn't too long ago, it might be 2021, where they, where some homoerotic poems were surfaced. So, of course, that reignited the debate on his sexuality and things like that. So, yeah, obviously the LGBTQ 
community have sort of a vested interest in looking at him. There's the military history, the Enlightenment thinkers with philosophies, political history with enlightened absolutism as well. I read something, um, a paper, New Avenues of Approach, and another source, which was the invention of Frederick the Great, how he really, I wouldn't say he pioneered, but he definitely contributed to the idea of, you know, state statesmen having a cult of personality. So I think that's essentially why he's had such an impact on different people from different aspects of life. Absolutely. You can't go through this time period without really talking about Frederick the Great and Prussian history. You mentioned a very important word in the last sentence, historiography. Could you possibly explain to our listeners what historiography is? In a simplified way, I think it's the study of sources. So as a historian, not only do you have to consult primary sources, you know, things written at the time, you have to look at secondary sources, things actually written by historians or, you know, just people after the fact or, you know, events, etc. And obviously the political climate of some decades, you know, it changes. So, of course, how we view people and events also changes depending on the time. To illustrate this point, I think I'll refer to a genre of films that were called Frederick films during the 1920s in Germany. And this is where Germany had a sort of a, a crisis of identity because they'd just lost the First World War and you had the Weimar Republic that wanted to motivate the German populace, you know, oh, we can overcome this, you know, look at what our statesmen have done. This is what Frederick the Great achieved and he had far less than we did as all that and then of course in the same period you have the uh, more nationalist scholars and the Nazis themselves just as one example of what they did trying to draw parallels between Frederick as a statesman and Adolf Hitler especially the films produced by the Nazi propaganda ministry that, to me that that's historiography just the study of sources yeah, the study of how history is written is, is what I usually have my personal understanding of it. It's it's a very meta topic. It's not something when you're first becoming a history buff, it's not something that you normally get into, but it's still extremely important in understanding the evolution from the events throughout that time period until now. Yeah, I think especially historiography is ignored in, in education in terms of, I don't know how it is in other countries, but certainly in the UK, you don't learn about historiography unless you actively pursue courses in history. I don't think you learn to analyze a source in you know secondary education, high school, but you don't actually learn about historiography until say university or A-levels. And I think that's, it's somewhat bad because it leads people to have a concrete view of history but it changes as to how we view it how we view people new evidence comes to light which forces us to change you know our interpretation and you know that that's all about history that's what historiography is all about is to make sure that our interpretations are up to date by consulting and scrutinizing what has been written in the past absolutely absolutely you brought up a great point that i'd like to broadcast to everybody that a good historian, and really a good person in general, when given new evidence and new information, should change their mind. It isn't about having this concrete view of history, as you said. Balance of evidence, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, so I think I'd like to move on to this part of this podcast where we talk about the historiography on the topic of Frederick the Great. So essentially, what are the best works to learn about Frederick the Great. So I'll give you five to ten minutes to talk about your favorite sources, essentially, and uh, about five to ten minutes for me to tell mine. All right. Well, my gateway drug, I suppose, this book by uh, Nancy Mitford. In my opinion, it's quite dated. It's probably, I wouldn't say fictionalized, maybe dramatized. It's written wonderfully. It's a, it's quite a nice, easy read. Good, uh, good language. Easy for anybody to follow. You know, who hasn't. Or, you know, doesn't want to pursue an academic background, just, you know, wants a nice, enjoyable read about a person. Perfectly fine for that, but I think that's where it, where it ends in terms of usefulness. Tim Blanning, in my mind, has offered the best comprehensive view of the king, and I think it's the most recent biography. That, in my opinion, that his is the best work so far, and decent language, 
you know, as in it's easy to follow, you know, because I think the trouble with academic sources is that the language can be a bit overly complex, especially if they're written for academics. And that'll lead me to Dennis Showalter's book. That's a very good book for the military history. However, I feel that the language can be a bit, it's it's over complex in my opinion. It's it's written for academics, so certainly that, that's the sort of target audience. I still would recommend it though for people who want to view the military side of things. There's the two works that I mentioned earlier. One is The Invention of Frederick Gray, that's by Matheson Curry. That's based on invented traditions, which is how it's difficult to study Frederick because the mythology in some places overtakes the real guy. That's a very good work and it's written by when he was at, um, at university, I think it was Albany. Lastly, it would be on Frederick the Great's sexuality, which is by Jackson Schobert. Frederick the Great's sexua- sexuality, new avenues of approach. That was in 2021 and that introduces a very balanced view, in my opinion, of his sexuality, which is another elusive part of the guy's personality. And yeah, it's quite vital to understanding him you know i thought this was going to be more of a debate but uh, absolutely for the most part i definitely agree with you that tim blanding is the most comprehensive book because yes while it may be a little bit dry i do think that dryness can be a strength because if you're looking strictly at the facts the historical narratives that surround frederick the great you're able to get more detail from this book it's extremely well sourced the the largest bibliography that i've seen about frederick the great through through his books this is less of a historian's opinion and less of a historian's filling the gaps where it's just presenting information that book has probably been the most useful for this podcast in general and of, of course you mentioned that it's this most contemporary it's the most new book the most new biography of frederick the great and the, the second book which i wish to discuss it's actually an older book. I was looking off to my right. Uh, it's, it's this book, The Military Life of Frederick the Great by Christopher Duffy. Duffy has a very huge knowledge of the geography of the campaigns, of the battlefields that took place if you're strictly looking on a military point of view. And I'm just amazed that he's able to... You can't really under, fully understand what these people were going through at the time because Really, it's impossible without a time machine. But with current writing styles, he is a great writer and is able to really put you into that setting. So understanding 1700s campaigning, military campaigning, he is definitely the best uh, source for that. And a uh, very, very distant third, uh, this book was published in 2000, David Frazier's book on Frederick the Great. The main reason I put this book in there is because one, it uses a lot of primary sources, talks a lot about Frederick the Great, and not just military, but it is a very strong emphasis on military because he was a NATO general. But he does talk about other aspects of Frederick the Great, which I think is very important to do. It's definitely a longer read. It's also definitely dated. But the reason I put that in there is because, one, you can get a lot of interesting primary documents about Frederick the Great that you wouldn't get in other books. And two, it's the main reason that this whole podcast started. I basically saw this at a used bookstore and thought, hey, why don't I create a podcast about Frederick the Great? First couple episodes are really crappy, obviously, but, you know, I think it's gotten better since then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, age like a fine wine. I've been listening to some of them. I listened to one with Brandon like a while ago. The YouTube has a good one. I've heard Duffy and Fraser as well come up in my readings. I didn't, I didn't read either of those books, so which is a shame because I did, I have heard great things. I find that, you know, the military side of Frederick is probably the easiest part to study because I think, uh, for example, if you're balancing him as a general, the data at hand is probably easier to manage with because you can compare the situations and how his other generals, you know, acted in the field. I think. Prince Henry, for example, you know, it's, it's 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 still quite complex and difficult because of the nature of warfare at that time. You know, like I think some people might criticize him a bit too much in terms of the order of battle. You know, it unraveled mid-fight, but you know that was kind of part and parcel of 18th century warfare, as I understood it. Especially when you're going through aggressive maneuvers, as Frederick the Great loved to do at the time. Yeah, to my knowledge, he I think I learned this from Showalter. He believed that shock was the way to 
um, you know, shock warfare was the way to beat the enemy in the field. And, you know, he was, you know, in my opinion, he had a point to an extent because the longer a unit is in a fight, one, they sustain casualties. Two, with all the smoke and confusion and no radios, it's so difficult to maintain cohesion. So he theorised that the best way to conduct warfare was then, you know, quick, intense fights. This also applies to the overall strategic thinking that we can't fight an extended war of attrition, which is, I think, what the Seven Years' War almost became i think a, a really good point that's been echoed by a couple of scholars is that frederick didn't win the seven years war he survived it you know and I, i'm inclined to agree literally just took the Tsar of russia to you know be a prussophile <laughs> so like yeah uh, the battle of kunersdorf as well he had uh, what two short uh, two horses shot under him so yeah and um i think by the time kunersdorf happens most of his skilled generals have like died it's amazing to think that Frederick the Great made it through the Seven Years' War without dying. But anyway, it did basically become a war of attrition. And after after that war, Prussia was barely standing on its own two legs. And obviously with the War of Bar- Bavarian Succession later on in Frederick's reign, it was just a slugging match between two exhausted armies between Austria and Prussia. I think it was documented at the time like tim blanning certainly mentions it how at the start of his reign and even through to the seven years war he's still quite a jingoistic ruler you know he's quoted so often as saying i love war for the sake of glory and then by the time the war of bavarian succession he's just so tired and you know you get the impression that he's a miser king because like really he'd lost most of his friends and his you know his sister his mother he'd lost friends and family to the war you're right frederick he he wasn't the same energetic man he was in his first few years of his reign and you know he uh, that mirrored the performance of his army as well yeah i've showalter criticized him for sort of disregarding what was termed little war so um that's you know the use of skirmishers scouting harassing supply lines something that the um austrians had well in hand with their experience fighting the ottomans yeah especially with the croats oh yeah yeah and like i think uh, this was a massive you know thorn in the prussian side ever since the first silesian war and then of, of course i think one of the biggest blunders is a uh, the march from Moravia. He'd lost most of his forces just to winter attrition alone and Hungarians like just, you know, harassing him. And I, I don't think he truly adapted to that, did, did he? Because um, Jaeger forces weren't really a thing for the Prussians until the Napoleonic Wars. But no, you, you bring up a very good point, going way back. With military history about Frederick the Great's reign, you're, you're more able to pin things down. But say with philosophy with art patronage with uh music he was a composer he, he was a historian he, he had all these different things he was a politician he, he did all these different things yet all in all a uh, man only has so much energy yeah and it's also really difficult because um and i think he admits to this essentially like you know the, the famous line the king is merely the first servant of the state so he must recognize that truly to project a powerful state he can't be himself so we really have to criticize and you know analyze in excruciating detail everything he writes and publishes because he's doing so with everybody watching him not only are um his citizens who can purchase books and you read but also foreign diplomats and things like that you know people of that vein and they you know he's under constant criticism and um you know constant pressure to perform well and portray a certain image he can never really say outwardly oh yeah i'm a man i fail at times you know he has to project an air of um invincibility and certainty like everything he does so you know he writes a history of my own times so as a role of historian we have to question like if you truly was a historian because i think to an extent when writing A History of My Own Times, when he was criticising his predecessors, not only was he trying to justify how his reign was better, but 
uh, in a way that it was more effective. But he also has to justify the great crimes that he committed, you know, the invasion of Silesia. And I think this Brandenburg had a reputation for diplomatic duplicity. And I think that this idea is certainly reinforced by Frederick's writings, you know, because he's not only is he just documenting it, but he's also trying to justify his actions and his rule, you know, whether or not Brandenburg could, and and by extension Prussia, could achieve what it could have. I think I get what you're getting at. You mentioned the duplicity of Brandenburg's diplomacy. He was writing to justify his own actions. Uh, and you're right. He may not have fully been like a, an academic historian. I mean, the, the profession historian really didn't come about until the, the 19th century, I'm pretty sure, in, in Germany, actually. He was definitely a, shall we say, popular historian, if that would be the correct term. The difficulty with Frederick, in my mind, is that you have glimpses of him being genuine. You get, you always get glimpses of his real person, but it's always flavoured with the image he wants to project. And at the end of the day, like it's hard to tell if that's him and his ego or if it's for, as he'd say in others justified, matters of state. It's why, for me, it's he's so fascinating to look at and yet so frustrating to study as well because we'll never truly get to the mind of a man. You know, there's a quote with him. I don't know what he, he, who he said this to. But, um, it was just on the eve of invading Silesia. He asks the guy, can you keep a secret? Oh yes, I mean he like he leans in closer, or uh, you know, and he says, "So can I?" Like I mean, that's the end of the discussion. You know, he's he's so elusive in his policy, his personality. It's just an endless enigma. That's a perfect way to describe Frederick the Great: an endless enigma. Thank you. I'm I'm I might steal that. <laughs> All right. So as far as the historiographical discussion, I I think this was great. Uh, a, f a few closing things I'd like to, to ask you. For one, what is your favorite story surrounding Frederick the Great? Okay, well, it has to... Be, it's not an anecdote per se, but it's a joke, and it's about Frederick and his composer. So um, the joke story goes, who rules Prussia? Why, it's Mrs. Kanz's dog. Kanz was the um, Frederick's composer and teacher. And the, the answer goes, well, the king is afraid of Mr. Kanz and looks for his approval. Mr. Kanz is afraid of his wife and the wife is enthralled to her dog. Yeah, Mrs. Kanz's dog rules Prussia. You know, <laughs> you know, I just thought it was quite an interesting anecdote considering with all the censorship and things, it was quite lighthearted. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that. And of course, Frederick was a, a dog lover in himself too. So who knows? Uh, he might have entrusted the, the decisions of Prussian state matters to, to dogs, you know. Could, it might be true. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I could have listed, like, you know, one of the um, events of his, you know, dogs or the horse, you know, the flight from Molvitz. You know, that, those stories are interesting because I think the, the horse... Uh, would join the military on parades you know he'd march beside them and then obviously the dogs were you know his beloved dogs i think his last his last words or something was oh you know fetch him a blanket my dog looks cold or something like that all right yeah so uh is is there any parting wisdom that you can give us uh to end today's discussion nothing is ever truly as it seems with this king you know just Enjoy, enjoy how we've got a lot of stuff written by him. You know, he's he's an interesting character, but be wary of what people want to write about him because they might want to peddle a message and never forget that he also wants to peddle a message. No, so that's a great way to end today's episode. Now, thank you so much, uh, Rin, for, for being on my podcast. It was, it was great having you on. Oh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about <laughs> Frederick. So. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. I want to again thank Rin for being on the show. He was very flexible with his time and was very fun to talk with. If you like the podcast, the best way to support the show is on Patreon. Please consider supporting me and you will receive benefits other listeners of the show wish they had. Thank you all for listening, and to conclude today's episode, I would like to say, bias is around every corner. It takes a lot to uncover it.